Welcome to a Legal AF Hot Take special on the United States Supreme Court oral argument today about what else? Abortion. They can't seem to stop wading into that issue. And I'm joined today by another legal contributor for the Midas Touch Network, a friend of mine also, Dina Dahl. You and I uh, the audience have all admired Dina's work so far, um, all the great stuff she's done on her own and with Francis Maxwell. And I thought she came to New York recently. Some people have seen us up on Instagram and we put our heads together and said, for the right moment, let's start doing some hot takes t together on issues that matter to both of us and to our audience. And I can't think of a better one, Dina, than to kick off our, our doing some of these, uh, what Ben and Karen like to refer to as duets, than on Moyle versus the United States and Idaho versus the United States, which is all about the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, which we'll now refer to forevermore on this podcast as EMTALA, and how EMTALA pardon me, has been used by the Biden administration and Health and Human Services Department after the Dobbs decision two years ago that ripped away a woman's right to choose, ripped it right out of the Constitution where it had sat for 50 years, the Biden administration, just, you know, again, elections matter, decided that one thing they were able to do with, with laws on the books was to use the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, EMTALA, to require all medical providers doctors and nurses, when they face medical emergencies with patients who need to be stabilized to use whatever medical care or treatment that is required, including abortion. Problem we have is that after Dobbs, 23 states, including Idaho, have either restricted abortion or eliminated abortion outright. Idaho falls way on the far end of the continuum. It's a ban except except for the life of the mother being at risk, which was a part of the oral argument today. We had an oral argument that was hot and lively, although I want to hear from you, Dina, next, about what you, can, can we get a sense of where the majority is and where it's coalescing. I can tell you who the leaders were right out of the gate after the first question by Justice Thomas, which was weird. It then got taken over completely and appropriately by Justice Kagan, Justice Sotomayor, and Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson. In fact, I thought Justice Kagan, among her her, her, her numerous uh, uh, roles that she played here, including at one point stepping slightly on the toes of a fellow, uh, a fellow traveler who oh, I'm sure agrees with her analysis, she did cut in on Ketanji Brown-Jackson and, and say, well, let me ask my question. And then Ketanji Brown-Jackson took it back. It was all friendly, collegial uh, work going on there. But I thought she framed the issue, Dina Kagan, well, and we have a clip we're going to play right now. Let's play Justice Kagan. To the medical community, it said, you know, the it, we're, 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 Congress was not going to address every treatment for every condition. But it said, you do what is needed to assure non-deterioration. So I guess the question here is, do you concede that with respect to certain medical conditions, and abortion is the standard of care. No, because the standard of care under, well, I should say, in Idaho, there is a life-saving exception for certain abortions. Um, and that is the standard of care. And the standard of care is necessarily set and determined by state. Well, I think you have to concede that with respect to certain medical conditions, abortion is the standard of care because your own statute, as interpreted by your own courts, acknowledges that when a, uh, a condition gets bad enough such that the woman's uh, life is in peril, then um, uh, the, the, the doctors are supposed to give abortions. And, and the reason that that's true is that with respect to certain rare but um, extremely obviously important uh, uh, conditions and circumstances, abortion is the accepted medical standard of care. Isn't that right? Yes, and that's, that was my point. Yeah. So, uh, by the way, I'll, I'll turn it over to you now, Dina, for your observations about the oral argument. I'll just leave it on this. Why is it always a person that looks like the assistant solicitor general of Idaho making arguments against a woman's right to choose and abortion rights? It's oh, I mean, like if you were doing like a cartoonist and you were drawing what that person would look like, it's always it always looks like a guy like that. Dina, what did you think about the oral argument? <laughs> But that kind of tees up to what I was thinking, because I have to say, I was having like a visceral feeling of hearing um, whether or not a woman's immediate death, right, the risk of death is soon enough to give her 
care. Like how close to death does a woman need to be um, who also happens to be pregnant in order to get life-saving care? Like that's what this almost distilled down to. And I, as a, as I still like, you almost have to take a step back and it still shocks me, honestly, that I'm here, um, that we are in this 2024 and we are dealing with this as women because being pregnant in America is now maybe may, the most risky thing you can be when it comes to healthcare. Because in Idaho, if you're pregnant and the life-saving care or not life-saving, because life-saving, they, they do allow for that, but serious, serious risk to your health. And what needs to be done is an abortion. You can't have it. So like being pregnant in Idaho is now this risk factor that makes you more likely to have very serious medical outcomes. And Justice Sotomayor, I thought she kind of captured a little bit of that feeling in some of her questions because you do think, how can this be? Um, you know, being pregnant and having an abortion in order to save your organs, save your reproductive organs, and then this law is saying no. And you do, um, to your point, have this, you know, man arguing that a pregnant woman shouldn't be able to have this kind of um, resource. And, and then you, you heard, you heard the Justice Alito, you heard Justice Gorsuch, you know, trying to really, um, you know, I thought be a little esoteric, right? They don't want to really talk about whether or not this woman is going to end up so seriously ill. They want to instead talk about the supremacy clause and whether or not, you know, Justice Thomas's question was, you know, has the supremacy clause ever been applied where the spending, because this is a spending act, right? And Medicare is, has to do with the funding to states, whether or not that preempts the criminal act of Idaho. And that's what he wants to talk about. Uh, but the reality is, is it makes it being a high health risk being pregnant in Idaho if the Supreme Court rules in favor of Idaho. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, and I like Sotomayor too, I thought she um, gave a series of examples in which women are whose, whose health are in jeopardy. And what it ultimately also came down to is not just women who come into an emergency room whose actual medical condition would require an abortion, maybe not to the limits of what is currently allowed under um, Idaho law, right? And leaving leaving any kind of gray area. You don't need gray area when people are coming in for an emergency procedure. You don't want doctors thinking, hmm, let me go look at my law books and my statutes. You want them jumping on this matter and making life-saving decisions. But the other issue that EMTALA requires is even if there's like a psychological or emotional impact, the person has suicidal ideations because of that. Um, now, uh, that, so there's a whole debate about whether you need to give an abortion or at least have that option on the table in order to resolve that issue. Or is there another way to, quote, stabilize the patient, which is one of the driving de definitions in the Imtala statute that came up time and time again here? What about stabilization until transfer, to use some uh, statutory um, language here, on the on the um, Mtala issue and about this, what you said is this critical, con what was a constitutional right of a woman to choose in this area now being left to individual state houses to set the standard of care, even when it comes to uh, abortion. I thought Kagan in her own way, a little bit sarcastic, but right on the nose and, and, and hit hit Idaho right where they lived with a withering comment to end her questioning of the Deputy Solicitor General of Idaho. Let's play that clip. I could say even if there's an ectopic pregnancy, that still that's a that's a, as a choice of the state and Mtala has nothing to say about it. And that understanding is a humble one with respect to the federalism role of states as the primary care providers for their citizens, not the federal it government. It may be too humble for women's health, you know? Right, it may be too humble mm -hmm. for women's health. I mean, for that, that sent the shiver down my spine because it was just in, in so perfectly uh, uh, caught, that, that, that um, a rhetorical phrase, uh, what we were going through. Now, the men participated on the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. Uh, Kavanaugh asked a, a, a kind of a quick question. 
Uh, Gorsuch did as well. Roberts was sort of, you know, keeping his cards very close to his vest. We've said on other legal AF and on other hot takes um, uh, that, and I've said this aloud, that this Supreme Court, at least on major issues like the one that, that we're dealing with here, yet another abortion decision post Dobbs by this Supreme Court, they, they, they can't help themselves but to continue to wade in to this issue time and time again. And every time they throw open the hood and start monkeying around under there, you know, it's a white knuckle, white knuckle moment for progressives and Democrats and, and people that respect women and their right to choose. And we have another one, another high wire act going on here now. But what I've said in the past is this particular Supreme Court and the way oral argument is conducted as presided over by the chief justice who calls on each of the associate justices, usually by seniority, that you usually know by the hot bench what, how their ruling is gonna be. Here, it is clear that Sotomayor Kagan and Ketanji Brown Jackson are going to keep that injunction in place and find that EMTALA requires and preempts here a federal preemption where the federal government has spoken in an area. A little breakout session here for for our, uh, legal AF when a, when a, a Congress has has deigned to act in a certain area, they oust the state in that same area and they can't regulate because there's been preemption under the supremacy clause by the federal government. And the federal government, the Congress having installed through the Medicare program, this EMTALA law, the argument goes for the Biden administration and the Solicitor General, therefore the states can't come up with a different standard of care than what is required under EMTALA, which is to, to stabilize and save the life of the mother and use whatever procedures you have at your disposal. So you, you've got, you, you kind of have that going on. And then, and then, but the question for me is, it was a little hard to tell, is the Kataji Brown Jackson, Sotomayor and Kagan world going to end up being the majority and one of them is going to end up writing it? Or are we just hearing uh, a, a early version of their dissents when the five votes go the other way? Look, Alito is going to find who wrote Dobbs that this is somehow Mtala oversteps federal supremacy and they can't force on Idaho uh, making abortion decisions as standard of care because they just can't do that. And so that's going to be him. And Thomas is going to join him. And then, and then the question is, what is Roberts going to do? Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, and are there going to be five or six votes? And we're only listening to the dissent. What did you think from what you heard overall, Dina? What did you think? Can we read a little tea leaves here? Do you think this is going to be upheld, or do you think it's going to be another loss for women's rights to choose? I mean, I agree that usually you can tell, but the ones who matter the most because they're the swing votes, the Chief Justice Roberts, uh, Justice Amy Comey Barrett, Justice Kavanaugh, really did, didn't did ask enough questions to, to, to really gather it. I mean, I did think Justice Amy Comey Barrett seemed frustrated at times with the answer she was getting from the Idaho lawyer, which means possibly the fact that she, uh, who knows, maybe that will help women's rights, the fact that she didn't get those adequately answered. Justice Kavanaugh really answered the asked the one question of basically how was that law um, interpreted? How is this criminal law interpreted in Idaho? Is it interpreted based on how the lawyer's talking here or how the Supreme the Idaho Supreme Court has interpreted? So really not enough to glean from um, whether or not um, how the Supreme Court is going to go. And, but I, I do think that, like, to your point of how we are now seeing this come up so much is, you know, how disingenuous the argument was in Dobbs to this shouldn't be federal, this should be states, and we're not actually trampling on uh, civil rights, a woman's rights to choose privacy rights. This is just a state's rights question, because what really has happened is complete chaos and uncertainty that has harmed women and frankly, doctors. I mean, they say that in Idaho, doctors are leaving. You know, they come into the profession because they want to help people, and now they may they're subject to jail time if they're trying to save um you know save a woman's organ and she happens to be pregnant and they can't do abortion it's making it untenable to practice medicine in a lot of these states and again the ones who suffer are pregnant 
women. And the Solicitor General, in one of the comments she made, said that every um, every other week, somebody, a woman has to be airlifted out of the state in order to receive care to prevent her from having serious illness. And she can't do it in Idaho because of this criminal statute that doesn't allow no. for it. And doctors there are scared. And that's stunning. That, that's also very telling and undercuts Idaho's position. The fact that a doctor makes a decision that the medical care required to stabilize and to transfer requires her to be airlifted probably means that person wanted to perform the abortion. You know, I, I'm gonna, I, I don't think this is too far afield. What if, what if Idaho or other states decided they want to, since we're going back to the 1860s anyway, why don't we take the way back machine all the way back to like the medieval times and maybe Idaho's um, electorate decides that leeches should be used in medical procedures instead of blood transfusions or something else. And they say that in our state, you have to use leeches as part of your medical uh, provision of care. So a doctor who has sworn a Hippocratic oath to save people has to therefore use leeches because the electorate in Idaho has decided that that is the appropriate medical care? Or is it that Mtala at the federal level has preempted anybody making wacko decisions like that about medical care and leaves it to the doctor and nurses to make the decision in real time right? As the emergency presents itself about what is in their toolbox to help save the life and stabilize the patient. That's the argument for the U.S. government as presented by uh, Solicitor General Liz Proliger. Um, I thought it was very compelling. I always love when they call the Solicitor General, 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 could you please, <laughs> please tell us what's happening here? I'm hoping, Dina, that at the end, that the vo the the uh, coherent logical voices of Ketanji Brown Jackson, uh, Sotomayor, and Kagan prevail on their on their colleagues. I almost called them the brethren because that's what they are referred to, even though there are now a lot of women on there. Uh, thank God, uh, and that uh, we won't you and I won't be reporting come May or June when this Supreme Court goes off for its summer holidays. Uh, that we have a yet another blow to women's reproductive rights to make the most intimate decision in their life uh, because we're going to support Idaho and impose that on everybody else. I mean, either in Tala, as, as Justice Kagan said, either it says what it says or it doesn't. In fact, Ketanji Brown-Jackson, and I do because I, I do like what you pointed out about her, Ketanji Brown-Jackson uh, and, and even Amy Coney Barrett basically said the same thing. They said, why are we even here? It's not. <laughs> I'd like for you to ent entertain the, the other possibility. You seem to be saying every situation in which the United States says, here's a stabilization situation that the United States would say the person has to have an abortion, the, the, the physicians uh, would say, we're following an Imtala and abortion is required. I thought you said in response to Justice Kavanaugh, yes, Idaho law would also say that's a situation in which an abortion is allowed. If that's the case, then it seems to me there is no daylight, there's no conflict, as you've said, but it's because Idaho law is in com full compliance with what the federal law is saying. We're getting it wrong, you're saying. Like this death thing, that's not what we really mean. What we mean is whenever it's necessary to stabilize a patient who is experiencing deterioration as federal law requires. No, I, I, I think I understand the point that you're making. And um, the best way that I can think of, of it, Your Honor, is that EMTALA's stabilization requirement requires medical judgment to determine what is the appropriate stabilizing treatment, right? And how does a doctor exercise medical judgment? Well, his training, his experience, perhaps reference to uh, professional standards of care that are national, but how necessarily about, about, state law standards as well. How, how about, um, that's not just something you're sort of coming up with. I mean, as Justice Kagan said at the beginning, um, Tala tells the doctor how he's supposed to decide it in this particular circumstance. If your position, Idaho, is that your exceptions to abortion would allow Mtala to be uh, complied with, in other words, giving as part of the toolbox of care abortion as one of the things a doctor can use, then why are we even here? Of course, when when the solic Deputy Solicitor General for Idaho heard that, he started to backpedal about, well, it has to be consistent with what Idahoans want.
I, th I think I got that right, uh, about, about uh, you know, abortion, and they've taken it off the books. So the standard of care in Idaho is different, but that's the point. And Tala says the standard of care should not be different when it comes to stabilizing a patient across the country, because you and I have equal rights and 14th Amendment rights that say, it, I, you know, I, 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 I should be getting the same emergency care. If I'm going to live or die, it shouldn't be a function of the voters and what they decided to do with the abortion thing. Dean, I'll give you the last analysis, of course, on this, you know, uh, this uh, this issue that is uh, royals, the spirit and the morals for our audience and certainly for contributors like you and me. Well, you know, it's kind of like Idaho wants its cake and eats it too, because this is a spending provision. They don't have to get the Medicare money if they really didn't want it, right? I mean, it's a huge amount of money and that's why Idaho wants it. So they want to be able to get the money that the federal government is giving them for Medicare, but then also not comply with it. Because the reason why this came into effect is because people who couldn't afford medical services, they didn't have insurance, they would, they would the federal government wanted them to show up at a hospital and get treated. And so now the question is if a pregnant woman shows up at a hospital, can she she get treated. And, you know, they made a good solicitor general made a good point. There's like on it, you know, you can um, not do the abortion if you have an objection. Even the entire hospital can do it based on like religious grounds. But apart from that, uh, you know, is being pregnant in America or in Idaho give you the right to less care than not having insurance? And that's kind of what it boils down to. Um, so I really hope the Supreme Court um, rules in favor of the federal government and allows women in Idaho to get the kind of care they need to stop them from having really serious medical outcomes. Yeah, that's great. Dina, again, I really, I really appreciate you joining me here. As people know, I, 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 this is a, an important issue to me as a person that supports women and women's rights. I've got my own personal issues around, around abortion rights that I've shared in the past. And um, but I wanted to do this and even moving forward, I wanted to do it with somebody exactly like you to bring, to bring your voice and your view to this particular matter. Sure. I could stare at the camera and talk into the microphone, uh, with the best of them on topics, but I, I, I think, um, there's something that's missed if I don't have my colleague, you know, and you particularly here on a day like this. So, uh, this is a legal AF special hot take Dina Dahl. Michael Popak, if you like the work that we're doing, there's one place for you to find it. It's on the Midas Touch Network. You know that. You're already here. You can sub free subscribe and help them get to 3 million before the election day. We are the network that you're building with us. No outside uh, advisors or investors, maybe advisors, but not but not investors. And then Dina Dahl does a lot of uh, amazing work here as a contributor, sometimes with Francis Maxwell, sometimes on her own. She's a leading contributor here on, uh, on uh, the Midas Touch Network. And then, of course, I'm on Legal AF. Uh, we do that on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern time right here on the Midas Touch YouTube channel and then on audio podcasts platforms of your choice. And then if you want to find work by Dina or me, go over to the Midas Touch YouTube channel, look under contributors uh, or playlist, and you'll find Dina Dahl. And you'll find Michael Popak and her whole body of work there if you find this interesting. So until our next uh, hot takes, single and double, uh, until our next podcast, this is Michael Popak and Dina Dahl signing off for the Midas Touch Network. Heary, heary, Legal AF Law Breakdown is now in session. Go beyond the headlines and get a deep dive into the important legal concepts you need to know and we discuss every day on Legal AF. Exclusive content you won't find anywhere else, all for the price of a couple of cups of coffee. Join us at patreon.com slash legal AF. That's patreon.com slash legal AF.